where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. The pandemic has certainly exacerbated the disparities in our communities. The public health crisis caused more Americans to stay home, and as the temperatures heat up this summer, we're reminded how uncomfortable it can be without air conditioning. But a lot of AC is the last thing our planet needs right now. In 2018, a report by the International Energy Agency predicted the number of air conditioning units worldwide will rise from one and a half billion today to more than five billion by mid-century. How do we respond to a warming planet when heat also affects our health and safety too? I want to welcome our guest to the show, Gabrielle Gabrielle Dreyfus joins us on Zoom. She's senior scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, also chief scientific advisor for the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, and she co-authored a recent UN report about cooling technology and climate change. Gabrielle, welcome to our show. Hi, Lucy. Also with us is Leticia Colon de Mejias, who's an energy policy expert, co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut, and she's the co-owner of Energy Efficiency Solutions. Leticia, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Gabrielle, I wanted to start uh, with you. Uh, When we think about access to air conditioning, uh, we know it has health and safety implications. Can you talk about in recent years how around the globe we've seen a serious uh, death and illness due to heat waves? Yeah, so let me start by providing a little bit of context. The the cooling, air conditioning, but also refrigeration is really essential uh, to health and well-being and productivity. So the World Meteorological Organization, for example, uh, recently came out with a report that says about 30% of the world's population is now living in conditions that deliver deadly heat at least 20 days a year. So this is uh, a really significant problem in the world. In the U.S., on average, more than 600 people die from extreme heat events uh, every year, according to the Centers for Disease Control. So this is, especially in a warming world, a uh, a growing concern and really an essential uh, part of our lives, uh, not just to keep us comfortable, but also to keep us productive. I I live in Washington, D.C., and I wouldn't be able to do the kind of work on a computer that I do every day if I wasn't, didn't have access to air conditioning in my house. Well, Leticia, when we hear those statistics from Gabrielle, it's really alarming. Here in Connecticut, before you started working in the energy efficiency sector, I believe you were in the health field. When we think about the residents in our state who don't have access to air conditioning and how it impacts their health, where do they live? Well, <clears throat> There are several low-income communities in Connecticut, um, and I like to look at this in the concept of not just access to um, cooling, but access to energy. So you can't have elect- you can't have an air conditioner without electricity. And in our state, four hundred thousand households can't afford to keep their lights on. So if we look at it in means of the areas of disparity in our state, we're really looking at areas where the housing is old and inefficient, or they have indoor air quality issues already, and then they have the additional burden of not having access to air conditioning. In the pandemic, uh, that certainly was exacerbated. If you think about uh, the people that have uh, lost their jobs and uh, lost their income, and uh, it's been really hot, and they've been told uh, either to stay home or keep their distance, that's hard to do uh, inside Leticia when it's 90 plus degrees uh, in communities, and it's it really shows uh, the disparities that that still remain. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I think, um, you know, when you're driving through the areas of poverty, you're seeing people, you know, outside on their stoop because it's hotter in their house than it is outside on a 100 degree day. So, again, if that building has never been addressed for thermal boundary issues, that heat is just rising to that top floor. So the tenants on the fifth floor, for example, are going to be in stifling heat and a fan just is not going to do enough, especially if you have an asthmatic child or an elderly person in that household. Or again, if you're living with an indoor health barrier such as mold, which is gonna be increased during, like yesterday was a very warm, damp day in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna exacerbate that and create um, additional health impacts on that family. Mm. Uh, Gabrielle, I mentioned cooling technologies. Obviously, air conditioning is a big one. But talk about what else, uh, when we say cooling technologies, what do we mean and how that is contributing uh, to our warming planet and the use of energy around our globe? 
Yeah, so when we're talking about cooling, I'm using that term loosely to Mm -hmm. cover everything from air conditioning, which is what keeps our homes and businesses and even our cars and transport comfortable. And this actually also includes heat pumps, which are reversible air conditioners that move heat from the outside to the inside of your home, which are very popular, for example, in Europe and are becoming more popular in the US. Then there's the refrigeration, which is really critical to preserving food and medicine. So we have our refrigerators in our houses, but during this time of pandemic, it's important to think of refrigerated cold chains, both for making sure that tests get to labs are preserved correctly, but really important as we think through how vaccines that are being developed are going to be distributed Uh, not just in this country, but around the world. And the third uh, category is industrial cooling. This can be for data centers, which we're all very dependent on right now for our connected world, but also agricultural production and other uses of industrial cooling. Mm -hmm. And yep, go ahead. I was just going to say that what you said about vaccine development, uh, that's especially an important point when we think about uh, cooling technologies. Yeah, very much. And um, I think it's really important to realize that there are a lot of parts of the world that don't have well-developed and uh, reliable vaccine cold chains. And so as the world races both to develop a vaccine, there are efforts looking to make sure that the cooling uh, devices for the vaccines that are going to be developed are uh, better for the, you know, for energy use and for the climate as well. When we think just when we focus on just air conditioning, how many, uh, what's the percentage in the United States that relies on air conditioning and what other countries uh, where you see that concentration? Yeah, so the U.S. is a, an example where most households, and I think the statistic is on the order of 87 percent of mm-hmm. U.S. households have air conditioners. And this is uh much more than in a lot of parts of the world. For example, in India, which is a much hotter climate, only about uh, 10% of urban households have access to an air conditioner. Um, We saw in the 90s a really, really rapid rate of growth in air conditioners in China where they went from similarly low levels to now most homes in China in the the cities uh, have an air conditioner. And as a result of this really rapid growth in air conditioning demand, cooling across all the, those three areas I just described accounts for about 17% of the world's total demand for electricity today. And the electricity demand for air conditioning alone in our homes and businesses could triple by 2050, according to the International Energy Agency. Mm. And when we think about cooling, I had mentioned it's a big contributor to greenhouse gases and climate emissions. Can you talk about, again, how much and uh, not just the the operation, the electricity, but um, the coolants that are used? Exactly. So this is why um, it's really important that as we look to meet the need for cooling, that we take advantage of the fact that we have a lot of much more efficient and climate-friendly technology and designs and policies that we know how to do. And if we don't take advantage of this time to put those in place and get those technologies out there, we run the risk of actually uh, using up most of the remaining carbon budget for staying below 1.5 C um, just from the sector alone. And that's because cooling both requires a lot of electricity which right now is mostly powered by fossil fuels like coal and gas that put out a lot of carbon dioxide, but also other short-lived climate forces like methane and black carbon that warm the planet. But they also rely on these coolants, these refrigerants Mm -hmm. that are mostly man-made gases that are very, very potent greenhouse gases, hundreds to thousands of times stronger than carbon dioxide. The good news is that the technologies that we have in place uh, that, we, that we know exist, if we were to put those out there at scale over the next 40 years, we could avoid between 210 and 460 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions equivalent, which is 48 years of our total emissions globally right now. 
You're hearing Gabrielle Dreyfus uh, with us on Zoom. She's senior scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. She co-authored a recent UN report about cooling technology and climate change. As we talk about uh, that today, also with us, Leticia Colon de Mejias, energy policy expert and co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut. She's co-owner of Energy Efficiency Solutions. Uh, before I go back to Leticia, you mentioned, uh, Gabrielle, you know, again, the significance of staying below uh, our global temperature staying below one and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, if it rises, it'll be catastrophic. That might be hard for people to wrap their mind about how what that exactly means. When we talk about these places uh, around our uh, planet where you've seen uh, heat waves, uh, if the temperature rises, what that means for, for, for specific parts of um, our globe and, and what that means for the residents there. Yeah, so one of the things that's important to think about is when we talk about 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, these are Mm -hmm. global average temperature increases. And what we actually experience day to day isn't the global average temperature. And we see a very strong correlation between the additional heat in the system that's adding to that global average temperature, but the frequency and intensity of heat waves. So um, the Internet Governmental Panel on Climate Change put out a special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius two years ago. And one of their conclusions uh, is that if we limit the warming to 1.5 instead of 2 degrees, Mm -hmm. that could protect around 420 million people from being frequently exposed to extreme heat waves. That's more than the current U.S. population. So it really is important to slow warming now to reduce the number of these extreme, though we're talking about temperature, but there's Mm -hmm. also humidity, Mm -hmm. um, these kind of extreme events that can cause um, a lot of uh, illness and death. Uh, Leticia, coming back to Connecticut, you mentioned earlier about the fact that our state has a lot of older housing stock, uh, multifamily homes uh, that may not be equipped uh, for not only uh, having the central air, but the fact that with our electricity grid and people not being able to afford the high cost of electricity uh, in our state specifically, you work for an energy efficiency company, company. Can you talk about the funding that residents should have access to for improving efficiency, considering our old housing stock? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, um, in Connecticut, we do have the Conservation Load Management Fund, which was put into law um, by Act 1180. And that fund collects a small bit of money on everybody's electric and gas bills. And then they use those resources to help people reduce their energy consumption and lower um, that that press on the grid that we were just discussing. Mm -hmm. So when we increase our air conditioning load, Um, We increase the total draw from our state for energy needs, and that in Connecticut is coming from nuclear and gas, essentially. And so that cost of energy, um, it's a supply and demand calculation. And so the more energy we use, the higher the cost of energy is per kilowatt hour. So because of that, our state was smart enough to create a program called Energize Connecticut that helps people access funds to reduce consumption by doing very simple things in their home. You can call and have an energy assessment. And because of COVID right now, that's free for everyone in Connecticut. They can call Energize Connecticut directly. And then after their energy assessment, they can get things done like air sealing and insulation in their home, again, at very low costs because of this fund that is there to support them. Unfortunately, in our state, we have had five times where that fund was raided and that money was taken and dumped into the general fund. So when that kind of stuff happens, what happens is low-income families suffer. Low-income families' cost of energy is about 25% of their household budget. So as um, we heard earlier in the mm-hmm. show, you know, you're talking not just about their cooling needs and their heating needs. Mm-hmm. You're also talking about refrigeration and cooking. So these are basic needs um, access to electricity, um, air conditioning, and heat. And when the funds get raided, um, they don't have access to that. Those programs get shut off when we run out of money. So in 2017, when that fund raid happened, about 12,000 families, low income specifically, were not served by the fund. They weren't allowed access to programs that would have lowered their energy consumption by air sealing, insulating, and even things as simple as replacing incandescent light bulbs with LED bulbs, which is part of the Energized Connecticut program, can lower someone's electric demand for lighting by two thirds, just Mm -hmm. replacing their lighting with LEDs. 
Um, I want to say something about heat pumps. So um, heat pumps are a really good way to make air conditioning accessible to all types of middle class and low income families. But heat pumps do run on electricity and they do increase our burden and carbon emissions. If that building is not properly air sealed and insulated prior to installing heat pumps. So um, energy efficient um, cooling um, equipment is very important, but if it isn't installed properly in a building that has been addressed, then we're still wasting energy and increasing our um, climate change burdens. Mm. That's a good lead into my next question, Leticia, for you. Do we have a sense of the scope of how uh, big of an impact when we think about inefficient home heating and cooling has on our state's carbon footprint? Yeah, so we could reduce our carbon footprint in Connecticut in buildings by 30% just by simply following um, a proven guideline at the Department of Energy in the United States of America um, mm-hmm. in the international IPC report, which says that we should be addressing our uh, old buildings and new construction to ensure they meet building code. So if we build buildings and retrofit buildings <clears throat> to have proper insulation and to be air sealed, have the right sized heating and cooling systems, once those buildings have been addressed, then we're going to have a lower demand on energy overall. Not only does it lower the carbon emissions, but it also will lower the cost of energy because of that supply and demand rule when we bid into ISO New England for our energy purchasing, um, which we do along with other states. Um, I think that, again, like the technology for heat pumps has come such a long way, and Energize Connecticut is running a pilot where people can get access to um, incentives and rebates to support their adaptation and adoption of heat pumps, Um, but it does require that that building do a thermal boundary assessment and that the system be properly sized, which is really a benefit to customers because they won't be paying for equipment that they don't need, they'll be paying for the right size system, and it will run more effectively both in the winter and in the summer, um, if it is, you know, the building is, is pro- properly addressed for thermal boundary issues um, and the system is sized correctly. Mm. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. You just heard Leticia Colon de Mejias, an energy policy expert and co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut. Also with us, Gabrielle Dreyfus, senior scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. She co-authored a recent UN report about cooling technology and climate change. We're talking about that today. And after the break, we're going to continue uh, hearing about the importance of efficient cooling options, uh, the role of renewable energies. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Do you worry about the impact of running AC all day when on your energy bill, especially this summer in the pandemic when your budget's tight? Do you think about uh, the impact uh, that all that air conditioning has on greenhouse gas emissions in our planet? My guests today are Leticia Colon de Mejias, an energy policy expert, co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut. She's also the co-owner of Energy Efficiency Solutions. And Gabrielle Dreyfus is with us, senior scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, who co-authored a recent UN report about cooling technology and climate change. Uh, Gabrielle, when we're talking about uh, efficiency, uh, what role can renewable energies play here? So renewable energies play a really important role in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with producing that electricity. And so we need to pursue uh, installing more renewables, getting those integrated into the grid. One challenge that air conditioning in particular poses, however, is that everyone tends to use their air conditioners at the same time. And so air conditioning is associated with something we call peak load. So the highest electricity demand is usually the hottest part of the day, which isn't necessarily when the sun is shining. So a lot Mm -hmm. of people run their ACs in the evening to cool things down so that they can sleep better. And so there's a really important consideration when it comes from the cost of integration of renewables to be thinking about the kind of uh, storage requirements, but also improving the efficiency of air conditioners means you can bring that peak load down and reduce the total capacity 
that you need to be able to meet that demand. This again is uh, Lucy uh, Nalpathanchel, host of Where We Live. Looks like I lost my connection at home, so now I'm switching over to Zoom. Uh, Gabrielle, my question to you was to talk about urban heat islands and how that impacts, uh, this, again, people in cities and how that's exacerbated when we think about climate change. It's a great question, and it relates to something that Leticia has been talking about, which is the strong correlation between vulnerability to heat events and low-income communities, and this is especially important in our cities. So urban heat islands, it's this phenomenon where our cities tend to have a lot more dark um, pavements and um, buildings and parking lots that absorb a lot of heat. And uh, so you actually, the Climate Central has a great tool where I looked up in Hartford, apparently, uh, on average, is two and a half degrees Fahrenheit hotter in the summer than surrounding areas, and up to 19 degrees hotter in some cases, so that um, you really can get this extra heat uh, concentrated in the cities. And that is exacerbated by people running more air, who have access to air conditioning, being running more air conditioning, which Throw, so rejects heat into the environment, you actually get this vicious cycle where hotter cities, you run more air conditioning, which makes them even hotter. And where you have this correlation is um, that the hottest parts of the cities often tend to be where the poorest communities live who have the largest struggle to get access to cooling. So this is a real issue. Hmm. Leticia, earlier we talked about the high cost of electricity uh, in our state. In the winter time, we know that there are programs to help people who are struggling to pay their heating bills. But what happens in the summer with cooling bills? This is a really great question. Um, so we have great programs in Connecticut that help people from October to April. But come April, we can all turn off their electricity. Uh, so we, because of COVID, our governor was kind enough to pass an executive order that there would be no shutoffs. And so this summer, people have had access to electricity and running water. Um, but normally, that isn't the case. Normally, come April 1, they could have their energy actually turned off. And like I said, over 400,000 households experience that annually in our state here. Um, but I, I, I want to say that, you know, something that was just said is so important about the heat index and the, you know, heat sinks that are happening in our cities. In addition to the heat sinks that are caused by all of those things like dark pavement and, and, and buildings, we also have uh, condensed high-rise buildings in urban areas. And so the higher floors on those buildings are hotter than the lower floors. So um, you've got an additional stacking effect of people being in close quarters. And then with this pandemic, we've really seen that people are stuck at home, nothing's open. So normally they could go to the library or their school or their YMCA for the summer, and they could be inside a cool area and safe potentially. But because of the COVID um, experience, people are being forced um, to stay in their communities and in their homes even. And so they really are experiencing this, um, experiencing this heat in a much different way this summer, even look at um, like restaurants are closed. So normally you could go grab a bite to eat maybe at your local establishment. And right now, again, people are eating outside with social distancing. So as the temperatures are rising, we're really seeing the disparity hit hard in the low income and at risk communities. Mm. Uh, Gabrielle, did you want to add to that? Because again, we're talking about here in our state of Connecticut, but nationwide, uh, we're seeing uh, similar trends. Yeah, so actually NPR did a study last year that looked at 97 of the most populous U.S. cities and found that uh, in more than three quarters of those cities, there's this very strong correlation between the higher urban uh, heat island effects and the lower income communities. So this is really uh, an issue across the U.S. The, the good news is that there are low cost interventions to help to reduce some of the heat islands. And this includes everything from planting trees to improve shading, which is not only good to, for cooling things down, it can actually cool by a few degrees, um, but it also can re remove air pollution, has that filtering effect on the air, which is really important for health as well. The other things that you can do are increasing the reflectivity of our pavements and rooftops and walls through, there's a, an organization called the Smart Services Coalition that's working with cities to get them to adopt some of these really low-cost uh, strategies 
for tamping down on some of those uh, urban heat island effects. Hmm. This is a really interesting time because we are in this pandemic and there is such an emphasis to how do we rebuild um, our economies after COVID. It's also a jobs opportunity, uh, Leticia, thinking uh, smartly as we move forward. Yeah, in fact, I was called to Congress um, in, in last year to talk specifically about climate change and the index to workforce um, and building efficiency. And one of the things I was able to provide in my testimony was the basic understanding that in 2017, Connecticut had 34,000 energy efficiency jobs in comparison to around 10,000 solar jobs. So investing and expanding energy efficiency and creating local job training programs for these career choices, such as being able to insulate housing, do energy assessments, or install ductless heat pumps that work for both heat and air conditioning, um, would completely rebuild our economy post COVID or during COVID, right? So investments in this type of jobs, in fact, in the report um, that we were just talking about here mm -hmm. from the UN explained that it is one of the highest return on investments and creates nine to 30 jobs um, in relationship to other areas uh, per million invested a nine to 30 jobs, which is literally one of the best return on investments that we can have for rebuilding our economy. Um, in federal legislation, there's a hopes for homes bills that would be um, that is up uh, for discussion in Congress um, that would allocate money to states to increase job training programs and energy efficiency careers um, and really could help re rebuild um, and get people back to work again. Gabrielle, we, we mentioned that UN report. I was wondering if you could talk more about, again, this really important time when we're trying to rebuild after COVID. Yeah, this is exactly a really important point that investing in making our buildings better, um, healthier for us, more efficient, uh, does have this huge uh, return in jobs per dollar invested. That's because not only are you paying for the technicians and skilled labor to improve the insulation, to uh, add reflective coatings to roofs. But if you reduce the amount of cooling load, you don't have to spend a much, as much on your air conditioning. That's dollars in a homeowner's pocket that can then go into the economy for other uh, purposes and create other jobs and sustain other jobs that way. You're hearing Gabrielle Dreyfus again, senior scientist at the Institute for Governance, Governance and Sustainable Development. She co-authored this recent UN report about cooling technology and climate change. Also with us here on Where We Live on Zoom, Leticia Colon de Mejias, energy policy expert and co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut, co-owner of Energy Efficiency Solutions. Uh, before we uh, talk about uh, solutions from a global perspective, uh, Leticia, I did want to go back to uh, this raid by the Connecticut General Assembly back in 2017, taking, I believe, $145 million from efficiency programs uh, from uh, to help uh, the state plug uh, deficits. I, I believe that you were a part of a lawsuit challenging that. What has happened with that situation? Yeah, it was like $165 million that they swept mm -hmm. into the general fund. And that lawsuit um, was really brought by a group of, of um, concerned advocates from many different areas, Save the Sound and um, myself, and then other contractors that really had to let at least 50 to 75 percent of their staff go after that funding rate occurred. Um, and Janet Hall in Connecticut, Judge Hall found that she didn't feel that there was a contract between the ratepayer who's paying into the fund and the state of Connecticut um, to protect their right to accessing those funds. And it went to circuit court, and and the circuit court also felt that um, the ratepayers who pay into the fund, you know, don't necessarily deserve access to the fund to help them invest in things like energy uh, reduction, approved energy reduction methods, and um, you know, improved HVAC or air conditioning. So right now, um, that is, you know, has been decided as something to not be protected. We do have a governor in our state, though, that has pledged to defend the energy efficiency funds and to ensure that they are not rated in the budget, um, it would be, it will be interesting to see, you know, what the budget looks like and whether they make some, what I would call forward thinking decisions to invest in expanding these career options and expanding training programs and energy efficiency programs so that we can truly address this energy burden. Um, energy policy is a very complex topic that most people don't think about, but every demand for electricity that we add to our grid raises the cost per kilowatt. Um, in the cost of energy overall, which again is 
a much higher percentage or 25% of a low income to middle class incomes annual budget. And so it's important for us to invest in things equitably, like removing indoor barriers in households so they can access these programs and reduce their energy burdens. You know, it's something uh, when we're when we talk about the pandemic, we know that uh, despite uh, aid from the federal government and the state of Connecticut, lawmakers are going to have some uh, real challenges before them, uh, Leticia, come the next uh, general session at the beginning of next year. Are you concerned that, again, if, if the state is really struggling, that that commitment that Governor Lamont has said uh, he will make towards ener- energy efficiency programs uh, may not happen? You know, with the pandemic, I think that it's so important that people understand the connection between health, economics, um, you know, and and even sustainability and climate change as it relates to our energy policy and budgeting decisions. So sometimes we do band-aid solutions, right? Like affording people money to pay their energy bills when the same investment, for example, be able to draw down their consumption by 30% and they might be able to pay their own energy bill. So I think that it really comes down to helping our leaders understand that there are ways to meet both our energy, economic, and health goals and still be equitable if we plan these things in a way that address um, issues at at like an order of operations. So for example, maybe before ensuring everyone has access to an electric vehicle infrastructure, which would increase our demand on electricity, that we would instead first address buildings, which would help health issues, indoor health air quality, sheltering in place, lowering our energy burdens, you know, heat stack effect, and um, help with the cost of energy rather than, you know, just for example, again, electric vehicles are lovely things, but, you know, it might be good during a pandemic to ensure that people have a place to shelter safely, especially, you know, again, summer's going to end and winter's going to come and we live in a cold state. So we have to worry about peak load both in winter and in summer. Uh, Gabrielle Dreyfus, I want to go back to you because I want to make sure that we have spent some time on solutions from the international community. There are tools, including what's, uh, I guess, an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Tell us about that. Yeah, so one of the things that is a really positive story from this is we have the technologies. We know how to make our buildings better. We know how to make cooling more efficient. So, for example, for room air conditioners, the average efficiency that people are buying, well, we have units on the market that are two or three times more efficient already. And in terms of the coolants, we have alternatives that are half or about a hundred times better in terms of climate impacts. And we also have a really important policy driver, and that's the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, which is really one of the most successful environmental treaties we have. Um, I don't know how many people remember that it wasn't long ago that we were worried about the destruction of the stratospheric ozone layer, which would have led to a number of skin cancers and cataracts and impacts on agricultural production, As we, because that's the layer that protects us from the harmful um, rate solar rays. Well, the Montreal Protocol was agreed in 1987, and it has, through a start and strengthen approach, not only put the ozone layer on a path to recovery, but because the chemicals that were destroying the ozone layer, these man-made chlorofluorocarbons and hydrochlorofluorocarbons, um, they were not only destroying the ozone layer, but they're super powerful greenhouse gases, that this, the Montreal Protocol by itself through, and the, the uh, bans that were put in place as people were learning about the harms of these chemicals, uh, has avoided the amount of warming uh, that uh, we are seeing from CO2 today. So it's really an impressive, a successful treaty. And in 2016, you mentioned the Kigali Amendment. Um, this treaty that has been strengthened and amended um, five times already in the past, uh, the countries said, okay, well, the replacement to those ozone depleting chemicals, the hydrofluorocarbons that aren't ozone depleting, are still very strong greenhouse gases. So we're going to take it upon ourselves now to transition away from these to more climate-friendly alternatives. And at the same time, because this treaty, by changing the coolants, 
drives industry to redesign all of the air conditioners and refrigerators, we want them to deliberately make that transition, improve the efficiency of that equipment as well. In the past, there have been these efficiency improvements catalyzed by the Montreal Protocol, but this is the first time that there's a really deliberate effort. And has the U.S. signed this Kigali Amendment, or do you anticipate it will? Yeah, so the U.S. is one of the countries, it was a it was a consensus agreement on the Kigali Amendment in 2016, and one of the steps is then to get it ratified and implemented in the U.S., And the U.S. industry, which is a major player, is driving this process right now. And they really want this because it's great for U.S. jobs. I think they had a study that said something like 33,000 U.S. jobs would come from ratification. So ratification will happen. And actually, states are already moving ahead. Uh, California has put in place a policy. And I think that there was a discussion in Connecticut was also working on a policy that would start the phase-down process of these super-polluting hydrofluorocarbons consistent with the Kigali Amendment. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank Gabrielle Dreyfus for joining us on Zoom, Senior Scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. We'll share out that recent UN report that you co-authored about cooling technology and climate change on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Gabrielle, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Leticia Colón de Mejías will stay with us. She's an energy policy expert and co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut as we continue to talk about this uh, importance of equity when we think about uh, cooling technologies. Also, environmental justice. We're going to hear from a Connecticut lawmaker about uh, what the general, how the General Assembly has responded to these issues. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel broadcasting remotely. Hopefully that issue has been resolved and you can all hear me. Uh, So we wanted to talk about um, how the Connecticut General Assembly is responding to environmental justice issues. So joining us now by phone is State Representative Geraldo Reyes, Jr. He represents Waterbury. He's also Deputy Majority Leader and Vice Chair of the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus in the Connecticut General Assembly. Representative Reyes, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. Good morning, everybody. We wanted to have you on the show today to talk about how the state passed an environmental justice law more than a decade ago. You have legislation that would update the law. So what has happened in the last decade? Why is it necessary uh, to update the law, especially for your community in Waterbury? So thank you very much for that question. So uh, so the the environmental justice uh, uh, bill, which is the uh, law of the state of Connecticut, was, uh, I believe, was introduced in the, in the, by uh, State Representative Jack Hennessy from Bridgeport, and I believe he was one of the uh, leaders of it. But the bill has not been uh, kind of revised or tweaked. And really what, what really got the, myself and a few uh, legislators from uh, the greater Water Bay area interested in this was the fact that uh, uh, we... Uh, actually challenged the environmental justice law in uh, Waterbury. We had a situation where we, where the community and uh, led by a bunch of activists and myself and some other people that were that have a vested interest in a particular area, which is the south end of Waterbury. Um, we believe that uh, we had enough pollutants there and that we had already had enough bad air quality. You know, there are uh, nights like uh, this week that we've had with the waste treatment plants. Uh, you have some foul air down there. You have the dog town down there. There's an asphalt plant down there. There's uh, gas tanks down there. Every there, I believe last count was 16 or 17 blue entities down there. And uh, there was just a whole bunch of us that really uh, dug in and said, you know what? Enough is enough. It's too much down here. Um compounded by the fact that we knew that we had some of the worst air quality in the Northeast and possibly the whole Eastern Seaboard, and then uh, compounded by the fact that uh, we knew that the asthma rate for uh, that particular area and the zip code 06706 was astronomically high. So connecting all those dots uh, told us that 
if there was something that we could fight for or if it didn't exist, we needed to create it. And we found the environmental justice law. We challenged it. We lost an appeal with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, and uh, not this session, but the session before, uh, I introduced a bill to uh, put a little muscle and a little teeth behind the environmental justice uh, law that's already on the books. And we were able to pass it uh, out of the Environmental Committee, and we and it passed uh, out of the House very favorably with bipartisan support. But unfortunately for all of us, the bill never got called on the Senate. So the, even though we were fighting to get it passed on the last night of the session, not this one here, not 2020, uh, not the one that just finished, but 2019. Mm-hmm. So our hopes is that uh, where we are today was uh, the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus made environmental justice one of its six priority bills for the special session. And it has since obviously been sliced off because the four bills that ran in the special session mm-hmm or the insulin bill, the telehealth, uh, medical, the uh, obviously the absentee ballot voting, and the uh, uh, the uh, the police accountability bill. Mm-hmm. So, when, Representative ahead. Reyes, when we think about again uh, this bill to update the environmental uh, justice uh, law that was passed more than a decade ago, it's especially important now when you think about uh, again how in environmental injustice issues disproportionately impact urban communities of color. It fits into this broader conversation about equity during a pandemic. Honestly, that you know what it it it, it had I had had I ran that bill that when the one the bill that we ran in nineteen that didn't get called in the Senate that passed. Had I uh, had that been this year, uh, I believe it would have passed, and I think it would have passed with bipartisan support. Mm-hmm. The, we clearly seen the racial and economic inequalities that exist in our country and state, and the BPRC has been dedicated to ensuring that the special session, which is the one they just have, if not that, then we are committed to uh, running this particular bill because it is very important due to the fact that their disparities are and the gaps are so large that uh, we have a commitment to run this bill in, in September. Uh, Leticia. So it's not done yet. Leticia Colón de Mejías is also with us, uh, and I know that you know Leticia. When you hear Representative Reyes talking about uh, this priority and the fact that uh, this law needs to be updated to help uh, communities of color, especially in our state, what would you like to see uh, come this general session coming up? You know, I'm really proud of uh, Representative Reyes, and I really enjoy working with him and some other reps um, in the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus. I think that there's been a new focus on environmental justice because of Rep. Reyes's work. And definitely Connecticut needs a focus on environmental justice. Um, During this pandemic, the environmental justice issues have really been expanded and changed. And as climate change becomes a more pressing issue, and as the heat index rises or we deal with issues like Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, where people had no access to electricity due to storms and couldn't keep their like diabetic medications cold or had nowhere to shelter um, in a heat crisis. Um, I think that these environmental justice laws absolutely need to have teeth and we really need to be demanding transparency and accountability and the way our state systems work to support the residents of Connecticut. Mm. Uh, Representative Reyes, I I wanted to go back to something we brought up earlier, and that was the legislature, the state of Connecticut's raid on energy efficient uh, funds uh, back in uh, in 2017. And then again, uh, you know, when we think about how other states have prioritized uh, energy efficiency, you can just look to the state of Vermont as an example. And then you have a state of Connecticut where you have programs like this, but then uh, when uh, there are difficulties in in filling uh, budgets and getting them back into the black, uh, the state has raided uh, these programs. I mean, how do we keep that from happening again? It's a great question. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd also like to say good morning to Ms. Leticia. She's a strong supporter of our environmental uh, group here. So thank you for your advocacy as well. You know, uh, that that whole time before the uh, funds were raided in 17, uh, Ms. Uh, Leticia Mejia's uh, with the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus, we did. We tried everything we could. We wrote letters in support not to do it. Um, you know, it was unfortunate that the gap that they were trying to fill in the budget was so large. And uh, we have to be very careful because uh, the gap is quite large right now. Again, mm-hmm. and uh, 
you know, you ask a great question, and I think that uh, my expectation is that uh, we're going to get uh, a lot more support from Governor Lamont uh, as he's looking at alternatives to uh, what's happening here in Hartford with their own uh, trash plan and so forth. So he's actually become more, uh, uh, if you will, more versed and in involved in the environmental justice bill. He's been a, he's been a big supporter. And uh, I think that uh, you asked me how. I think that uh, it starts with leadership. I think if we can get uh, Governor Lamont on board to support these particular initiatives, that uh, not to raid these funds again. Hmm. Uh, Leticia, I want to just go back to you again. Uh, Representative Reyes has been a partner in this, uh, but are you confident that uh, the state will take a better approach uh, in the future as this issue continues to weigh on our communities? Yes, I think that Governor Lamont um, is a very critical piece to this, as is the Department of Energy and Environmental Protections. You know, we have a new administration there as well. It is very critical that our state government Uh, both our governor and the leaders understand that the nexus between our economy, our energy demands, and our health. Well, I want to thank uh, Leticia Colón de Mejias for joining us here on Where We Live. She's an energy policy expert and co-chair of Efficiency for All Connecticut. Uh, Leticia, thank you. Representative Reyes, thank you also for calling in today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Ms. Leticia, have a great day. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Today's show was produced by Carmen Baskoff. Our technical producer is Cat Pastor. You can learn more about the show. Just download us on your favorite podcast app. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We hope you have a great weekend. <laughs>